Okay. Hi. Thank you for coming. Uh, I need to stand over here so I can press the buttons. My name's Alex. Um, uh, this is Agur. We work at SKA. Um, and uh, today, hi, please come in. <laughs> today, we're going to tell you what the SKA is. We're going to tell you, um, yeah, what we're trying to do there. Um, and we're going to, um, yeah, talk about some themes um, along the lines of uh, how to make a sustainable observatory that does open reproducible science um, uh, in a way that um, uh, that hasn't perhaps been done uh, in the past in traditional uh, astronomy. Okay, yeah, so I'll, I'll outline, yeah, just very quickly, we'll tell you how to do astronomy. <laughs> um, then we'll give you a quick outline to SKA. I think I've just said all this. We're going to talk about processing data at scale. You're going to see why that's important um, with the data rates that are coming out of, of this telescope. We're going to talk about SAFE. Some of you may have heard of SAFE um, and Agile. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, what that is and, and how we try and do it at SKA and why that's important for such a big project. Um, and yeah, we're going we're gonna to come back to the themes of uh, sustainable, reproducible science in the era of big data, which is a phrase many of you maybe have, have heard before. Um, we're going to do Q&As at the end. Um, you can put up your hand, or we'll give you a microphone, or you can type questions into Slido uh, during the talk or at the end, up to you. Um, okay, so uh, traditional way to do astronomy. So. This is Edwin Hubble, and in early, early 19 uh, something, 1915-ish kind of time, he was using a telescope that looked like this to look into space. And it was all very much done by hand back then. And you would sort of take a picture, or maybe you wouldn't even be able to take a picture before that. You would just look. And so what I'm trying to say, oh, we've got a hand up. No, we haven't done that yet. No worries. Um, yeah, so so the the amount of data that Edwin here was capturing was very small. Um, a, a picture or like a handful of pixels or maybe some notes he would write down, okay? Um, and since uh, 100 years or so ago, we've come a long way and the data rates that we're, we're getting now uh, on a different scale completely. And that presents uh, a very real challenge, even compared to the last 10 years. The, the amount of data that we're capturing has gone up by um, such a magnitude that we need to rethink how we do data capture, data storage, and data processing, and, and how users are going to interact with the data. So a typical observation life cycle um, an astronomer would uh, propose for an observation. They would say, I want to do this because I think I'm going to learn something about the universe in this way. Um, so they do a proposal. Um, they'll probably won't worry about how much data is going to be captured. They'll just, uh, they'll just say, you know, when, you, when, when the observation is done, just email me the data or drop it in a, in a Google Drive folder or uh, at worst, send me a bunch of hard drives. The the observation of the supermassive black hole, the center of our galaxy, and and in uh, M eighty three, uh, that was done. They put all of the data on hard drives and then just shipped the hard drives to one computing facility. So it took many months to get the data there, and then to download the data from hard drives to process it. Um, but even that is is going to be infeasible for SKA. Um, uh, so yeah, the point is, up until now, most of astronomy is done on people's laptops. People take the data, they you know, download it to their laptop, maybe they have a fancy computer provided by their institution, um, and they do all of the processing sort of um, by themselves, so to speak. Um, but that is changing. So this telescope that we are building, and I say we, we're an IGO, we're an intergovernmental organization, um, we have, and I forget the number, of the order of 20, 30 countries signed up um, to this. Um, and there's going to be two telescopes under one observatory. 
So let me just very quickly outline, I'm not going to go into too much techni technical details of the telescope. So basically, there's one in the Western Australian desert, and there's going to be 100,000 or so little Christmas trees. Um, they're, they're basically fancy TV aerials, and you put them together in these, as on the, on the left there, uh, in these little arrays, and they look at low frequencies. They look at the universe in low frequencies um, of the order of 100 megahertz. And then on the right hand side, there's going to be a completely different telescope built in South Africa. These are maybe what you're used to when you look at radio telescopes. They are big dishes, and there's going to be a couple hundred of them scaling up. Um, and these sites are chosen because they're away from humanity. Uh, we do not want any interference. Um, yeah, so these and these two telescopes come under one observatory, and the headquarters for this observatory is uh, in Manchester, it's at Jodrell Bank in Cheshire. Um, so the kind of data we're going to be looking at here, um, when you think about uh, think about global internet traffic every second, we're going to be capturing ten times that every second. Um, so a typical observation will be a hundred terabytes. We're looking at uh, you know, 12 times, many of you know LHC and CERN, so it's maybe a nice comparison, 12 times that um, kind of data. And the kind of compute required to, to deal with all of that is, is amongst, you know, we need one of the top three uh, fastest supercomputers in the world right now. Um, so on this little schematic, the top row is those uh, little Christmas tree TV aerials. Um, 100,000 of those. So the data coming directly from those is two petabytes a second. Um, that goes into a signal processor and then uh, gets, um, how to say, the simple way to say it, it gets averaged down because there's there's far too much there to actually, we would love to keep all of that, but it's just not not possible. Um, and then you can see as you go along to the, uh, the science data processor, the data rates come down as you process and average it. And then there's this box at the end called uh, SKA Regional Centers. And that's the bit we're going to be, but that's the bit that users focus on. That's the bit that users care about. Um, so that's the bit. And so you can see these little, uh, these little people uh, with lines through them. So the people do not interact. When I say people, astronomers, users do not interact with the seg central signal processor. They do not interact with the science data processor. They say, we want to observe this target. We want this data product as an output. And then they get given that data product. So it could be an image. It could be a time series. Um, they then cannot go back to the raw data. So if, if they want to reproduce that result, they have to observe again, because it's just impossible to keep the raw data. So we need to make these things called SK regional centers have all of the tools required for users um, to access data. And this is very much computing done in the cloud. So they will not be able to download the data. Well, maybe they'll be able to download small parts of it, but they will be bringing their code to the data at regional centers. And these regional centers will be distributed throughout the world. There'll be one in Europe, China. Um, well, there'll be, there'll be many in Europe, China, South Africa, Australia. Um, so they will be bringing their code to whichever one the data is located at. Yeah? And at these regional centers, um, this is where all of the uh, all of the the science happens, basically. So you've got tools built in that we're trying. So we are trying to build in tools into these regional centers that enable things like uh, Jupyter notebook notebooks, um, pre-built machine learning pipelines, um, pre-built processing pipelines that users can pick and choose from, um, some image processing, image analysis techniques. Um, users are going to be able to discover data at these um, centers here. So this is really the hub um, that users go to, um, to to see the data, to visualize the data instantly, um, and to get the compute uh, to get access to the compute facilities required to process the data. Um, and just a note on previous uh, uh, telescopes that, are, that have existed. So many of you probably know the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, very successful telescope, but it's most successful because the most science has come out of it is from archival observations. It's very important um, to make sure that your observations are made public and that people can look back and access that archival data. 
And another one which you maybe haven't heard of if, if you're not an astronomer is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey on the left. Um, and that one is one of the most cited surveys in the history of, of astronomy because they've made the data so easy to access for even the public. You can go to that website, you can just scroll around the sky and look at things. And that's one of the reasons why it's so successful. So we're trying to replicate these, uh, what has made these things uh, so successful. Um, so hand over to Ugu now. He's going to talk a, bit, a little bit about uh, the next topics. Yeah. Uh, so uh, <coughs> sorry. Uh, so yeah. Uh, uh, Alex talked about the science part a little bit. Uh, what we want to achieve in that, and I just want to we focus a little bit on how we do that. Uh, so how we are building the uh, SKS software itself uh, because it's a very hard thing to do from all from ground up because of the data requirements that we currently have, and. Um, since uh, the project involves many countries across the globe, uh, that means we need to enable global collaboration at a scale uh, to deliver world-class software. And uh, basically, these are the, uh, our uh, strategic objectives uh, we have set uh, for the SKS software, uh, telescope software, uh, which should transfer and apply to the uh, scientists and research engineers that are using SKS software as well. That's the aim we want to keep. Uh, uh, basically, we want to create and sustain a trustworthy uh, environment. Uh, we want to work in an agile mindset, which I'll explain a little bit more in detail. Uh, our focus is developing a high quality, uh, uh, world leading data product software because uh, the lifetime of the SK is over 50 years. Uh, so uh, we have to make it very sustainable and easy to maintain for others uh, that will come after us. And uh, the only way to Having a distributed uh, collaboration is uh, fostering a diverse and inclusive cultures uh, and that will enab enable creati creativity and that will enable other people, other researchers to come up with uh, very unique approaches uh, than we are, we are now taking. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so, the, we are uh, using uh, SAFE. Uh, SAFE is basically a scaled agile framework. and. Uh, in that uh, framework, uh, those are th there are team called arts. Uh, so uh, those are agile release trains. Uh, so that's the analogy. So we are uh, basically operating trains uh, across the globe to deliver our, uh, our uh, telescopes. And um, yeah, uh, at the heart of those trains are the continuous exploration, continuous integration, and continuous deployment for the software development. And you can see a small picture. Uh, there as well, uh, thanks to AI, gen AI generation. And um, so I talked uh, I talked in my lightning talk yesterday about the quality as well. So just to put some numbers, uh, we have 28 agile teams. Uh, we have two more than 200 people that are working from every blue country that you can see on the map, uh, collaborating uh, for the software development uh, for the for the project. So that means we have different time zones, cultures, different experiences, uh, different uh, uh, code bases, uh, and we try to enable this with a small central team that is in HQ. And we have realized that the only way to make sense of this is to deliver a consistent level of quality and uh, to be or to try to be on a time and budget uh, as much as we can. And uh, which we have chosen safe uh, to do that. To do that, so we are using safe uh, way to develop and collaborate. So right now, uh, you can also see that we, I said we have three trains. Uh, and in the safe framework, those trains are categorized into the, whether they are stream aligned. So they are delivering a value uh, that can be telescope monitoring control, that can be one of the processing uh, workflows for the data. And you have enabling teams that will allow other teams to deliver what they need. And uh, you also have the platform team that basically lays the tracks and uh, sets up the pipeline in each countries, connects the cables, uh, sets up the Kubernetes clusters uh, for people to deploy their software and so on. And uh, right now we have the analogy of most of the teams are uh, uh, focusing on the delivering the monitoring and control and data processing. Those are the stream aligned teams. We have teams uh, that are working on the infrastructure and tooling, that's the enabling and platform teams. and we want to keep the same analogy for features once the uh, development of the software is complete and the observatory is operational so that the scientists and institutions are uh, uh, acting like stream aligned uh, teams uh, and the telescope itself is enabling uh, 
uh, new discoveries for those people. Uh, so uh, to do that, we need portability and scalability. We have chosen containerization as our basis. Uh, we have to make our data secure uh, while keeping it open as uh, uh, basically we want to keep the data open, but we want uh, we want to secure so that we are not exposed to any, any any kind of attack. It needs to be reliable. It needs to be reproducible as much as we can because we can keep the raw data, but we can keep the pipeline in a reproducible way. Uh, it has to be extensible. We have seen that uh, SDS, SDSS database is cited over 100 million times, uh, over, five, over six, 600 times, 600,000 times, sorry. And we want to, we want to replicate that, and the only way to do that is uh, having a uh, very open, transparent platform that will allow us to have uh, SKA available for everyone. And uh, basically, the we we want to keep all of our processes and all of our products uh, as as sustainable as possible. And uh, that is actually one of the lowest practical common denominators we try to adhere to. And uh, with that, I'll give back to Alex. Uh, yeah, so um, we wanted to um, finish off with uh, some of the things we've been trying to do to promote open and reproducible science and really to prepare the science community um, for SKA um, because if the community continues to do things in the way that they've done traditionally, we're not going to have a, we're not going to have good science. We're not going to have reproducible or open science. Um, so yeah, we want to make it easy for users to cite workflows and to obtain their data. We want to really lower barriers for entry um, at, at all of uh, as much as possible. Um, so one thing that the observatory has been doing is running data challenges, um, and these give uh, examples of things that the community are going to face when they get given SKA data products. Um, so yeah, the, the obvious thing here is they're going to be a lot bigger. Um, so uh, what one of the data challenges we did was give the community simulated images. So this is one on the right here. Um, and told them to tell us, uh, you know, how many, how many sources can you see in this image? Can you tell us what they are? Um, go run your, your pipelines and, and, and see what challenges you face. Uh, and the first initial challenge is, is this image is 32,000 by 32,000 pixels. So a lot of traditional code bases will just fail straight away because they, you know, you need a lot of RAM to load that image in and to do processing at that kind of scale. Um, so there's ways around it. You can chop the image up or you can, you know, write your code in a different way. Um, so, well. In, in case any of you are not astronomers, these are, these are radio galaxies. We're looking at radio wavelengths. So every dot you see in that image is another galaxy. And then the extended fuzzy dots are um, what we call, uh, uh, so that, that's the effect of supermassive black holes ejecting uh, large streams of particles that radiate at, at radio wavelengths. Uh, so you get very pretty images. Um, yeah, so, so in these challenges, we were, uh, teams and and they were very popular we had teams from all around the world try and um, participate in these um, teams from a lot of, a lot of different institutions and they in this one they were given a challenge to find as many sources as possible tell us what those sources are tell us some properties about them and then we rank the teams on basically on how successful they were um, but another thing we ranked the teams on was how reproducible they were um, so we came up with this scheme, and this is by no means a complete scheme, but we, we tried our best to come up actually with help from the uh, from SSI uh, and from Rachel Ainsworth um, and probably other names that I, I can't remember right now. But we came up with this, uh, this scheme to rank teams by how reproducible they were. Um, and we wanted to rank them because we wanted to... Some teams, this is very obvious, but we found that for a lot of teams, this was not obvious. They, it wasn't obvious to follow code standards. It wasn't obvious to do testing. Um, it wasn't obvious to make their code easy to install for someone else. Um, so we came up with this list of criteria and, and arbitrarily just said, all right, bronze, silver, gold, depending on, you know, some of them are harder to do, they take more time. Some of them are pretty easy to do. 
Um, and yeah, it's no means a complete list, but it's a start. So you can read um, some of the ones on there, you know, in, in these various themes. Does it have a license? Is the code accessible? Have you followed any coding standards? Um, do you know what unit tests are? Um, yeah, have you got good documentation? Um, you know, basically, if you if you have you put it on on Git or another equivalent uh, software distribution um, site, um, uh, and and have you thought about how easy it is for someone else to come up to the same conclusion that you did? Um, and yeah, you can go to this if you're interested in in looking at more about these these challenges. There's a link to the website there. Um, but we found this was actually really successful. Um, in terms of getting people to think about these kind of things. Um, and we found, yeah, we had good feedback from the teams in, in that they hadn't really needed to worry about this um, a lot. Um, and, and thankfully, in the last yeah, number of years, this kind of theme has come up um, more readily, particularly for larger um, uh, science collaborations to try and make their science uh, reproducible in that way. So yeah, this is one of the things we're, we're trying to do. Um, yeah, and, and so this is uh, our penultimate slide, I think. So we, we really want to maximize science output. You know, obviously, as an observatory, that's what you want to achieve. You want to discover new things about the universe. And the only way to do that is to make, uh, make your data um, discoverable, easy to work with. Um, and to make the science reproducible and sustainable. Um, so coming back to this theme, we, we talked about regional centers and, and how they will be the enabling facilities for scientists. Um, and we want to make sure that they, scientists have all the tools that they need at those regional centers. Um, so like, like I've said, data discovery is easy, intuitive. Um, we want to support the scientific community as much as possible. We want to get feedback from them on what they want. So we're getting that feedback through the through the data challenges to see um, what have they struggled with, where can we provide additional tools, how can we make it easier for people to, you know, cite workflows. Because um, if you lower those barriers, you'll find that people will do these things much easier, uh, much more without even thinking. Um, yeah, and as an observatory, we have a you know responsibility to make their lives as easy as possible, but um, it's not trivial to understand how our approach will influence users. So um, we can learn a lot of lessons from uh, a lot of you guys here, um, from a lot of uh, industry practices, from other science uh, instruments. Um, yeah, so we're, we're hoping that you guys have some ideas as well. Um, and it will be a continuous process, because I'm sure that we'll do things that uh, that present issues, um, and so we really want feedback at all stages from users on how to make this uh, easy. I think that's the last thing we want to say. So we can do a Q and A now. Thanks for listening. Uh, okay. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'm presenting next, so hopefully you'll. Does this work? Yeah, hopefully you'll stick around about user feedback. Um, curious, uh, and I know Agile has the concept of lean UX or a process for gathering user feedback. Have you integrated user activities into your workflow yet? Or are you planning to? If so, how? So uh, since we are just finished almost building the infrastructure and testing facilities, uh, so we are we first focus on getting something working for the monitoring and control, and we actually created a community of practice for our user experience uh, in the project. Uh, because we are globally distributed, we have a lot of community practices, and that is one of the ones that is uh, advancing uh, exponentially right now, because we are talking with the operators, uh, we are talking with the scientists to understand their use cases, and. Uh, I think we have two teams, uh, eight or nine people that are now working on uh, creating those user experiences uh, to make it basically uh, a, 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 good, a good experience for that. So, yeah. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, so, what was the makeup of like the, the data workshop you ran like? Was it more the case that you were delivering it to new people so they got best practice baked in as they were coming up? Or was it 
were you able to reach out to you know like the old stuck in their ways people who've been working in the field forever um yeah and if not how would you go about doing that like what is the stick to beat professors with yeah that's good that's a good question um we had a, a wide variety of experiences we had people who already followed um all of these practices and and you know had very excellent well documented solutions um and then we had teams that had done nothing like this before which uh, you know uh, i want to say is is surprising but i don't want to like um you, you know they perhaps those teams have had a different experience of science doing science so i i'm trying not yeah there's there's no right or wrong way but um but but even though they'd done none they hadn't really thought about reproducing they hadn't used git before they you know they hadn't shared their code when we initially asked some teams to share their code they just emailed it to us <laughs> and we're like okay this is it, it's, it's a good start right um so but yeah we found the reception to be positive once we sent them some guidelines uh, you know you can do this you can do this like, oh okay and then and then they they tackled some of them um uh so in terms of like seniority level um I'm not sure I have any conclusive statements to say about that other than maybe the the teams that struggled with some of the reproducibility guidelines that we set out, maybe it was the more junior people in the teams that went the extra mile to try and achieve them, um, perhaps because they're, I'm extrapolating a little bit here, perhaps because their supervisors were more interested in like, get the result, submit to the challenge and participate um uh and then it was very much the observatory uh saying oh your, your result is good but can you do this little extra bit to make it can you like show how you've done it um so we found that the voice of the observatory was uh quite strong in that sense coming from a, an observatory that's going to do like it's going to tell you a lot about the universe that we can't we don't know yet that that was a very strong presence so we yeah we we were pleased with that um yeah other ideas for for getting people um particularly those uh, more senior who haven't really thought about reproducibility tools um i think you just have to keep uh trying your best to to share the the right message and uh i think it will become clear that you won't be able to achieve uh, science output with this telescope without following those principles. Uh, so I think that in the past with other telescopes, maybe you can achieve, you can write papers and stuff um, without really having to worry so much about reproducibility. But I think in our case, given the data scale and the volume and the fact that all the processing will be done at these regional centers, you really can't get away with it. Um, and it, we almost want the record to be built in. So if you do processing at a regional center, whether you like it or not, there will be a record of what you've done to that data. So, uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, we're running the workflow hub here in Manchester. So feel free to use stuff for your workflows to get them citable with DOIs and so on. And uh, part of that is also capturing lots of metadata about where it's coming from and how it's executed. So we can help you with all of that. I think it sounds like from what you're saying, most of users were not using any formal workflow system where they were just doing some random Python code or things like that, or were the people using existing workflow system because they can help with many of these reproducibility features. Yeah, some people would use software that's been established in astronomy. Um, and I would say most of the big established software packages in astronomy, they do have Git repositories and stuff. So that, um, and, the, and the best teams took those and then wrote a new Git that was specific to the, the workflow challenge. And they use things like Zenodo to give DOIs to the particular, um, uh, how to say, the particular, like, this version, we use this version of the software and, and this, uh, well, the data is was put on Zenodo as well. So they have a, that, that has version control. Um, yeah. 
I think one part of the challenge was since the before and not until the many recent years, the the, the way to uh, analyze your data is take it offline uh, with some of the ways Alex explained and analyze it as uh, however you you like. So that means you can create some custom secrets. You don't have to share them because uh, at the end. Um, uh, it's uh, the focus is on the paper itself uh, to to uh, to describe what you have found from the data, but with with SK that's not possible because of just because of the scale of it. And so uh, we are asking everyone that's part of the challenge for us as well is uh, we need to come up with a way so that uh, these uh, the, the the way you get the data, process it, share your results has to be reproducible because there is no other alternative. So it has to be sustainable. It, we have to keep a record of it. It has to be shared and public so that others can benefit from what you have found. And he, as Alex said, we have found some people were doing very good. Uh, we have found some were basically just running custom Python scripts. Uh, and uh, we are trying to align uh, the uh, community in that way a little bit. So. Yeah, uh, we will need the help uh, yeah. as much and, as we can. And that's the same thing we're trying to do with research objects. You give it the results out with the workflow or the code that you used to run it and the attributions and so on. So definitely you should try to do that. I think you should try to have more like demonstrators, right? So you're saying here's a good example of something that you can build on, right? Because then half the best practice will already be in there because they see how all the codes already packaged in. I just need to do my little thing in the middle that will help people get gradually into the best practices. This this is a, so this is part of our goal for the data challenges. So every day we've done two two and a half data challenges so far, uh, and we're going to keep doing them. There's a whole team working on data challenges, um, and so every data challenge, particularly now, is there's really an emphasis on uh, having that workflow published and. You know, there's nothing new scientific coming out of these data challenges. It's, it's simulated data or it's known results, but people are still publishing papers saying it's a known result, but we've the paper is about how making it reproducible. Um, so yeah, going forward, doing more data challenges, they will all be following that principle of like here's an example. You know, data challenge three, data challenge four. If you if you're new to it, go back and look at the previous data challenges. Look at what the teams did and how they how they followed these guidelines, and then eventually, if you do enough of them. When people get to the real data, they'll have enough, like you say, examples of, of workflows, and they won't really need to uh, uh, to worry too much about new things. So, uh, yeah, I was just going to do a bit of uh, matchmaking here. So, uh, so Stian's quite an expert in reproducible research and representation of reproducible research and the workflow hub system, which is produced here in, in Manchester. And you guys, are obviously, experts in actual data from astronomy it might be an interest i don't know if you're all staying around for the hack day but it might be interesting to get together and have a little chat about what you know whether there was a merge possible of some of the concepts and ideas and manifestations so i just wanted to say that yeah sounds good i'll be around for the hack day so we can catch up since you're like since the sk is obviously a very big thing in astronomy have you considered or had any success with if you've tried approaching journals like if you said to Munras, can you insist that anybody who uses SKA data includes like a link to their workflow or something? Would that would that work? Is journal level enforcement a thing you could try, or is it a thing you've just not we have considered? discussed this? Yeah, we have discussed having a publication policy that explicitly states you need. Well, there'll be certain things that you need to cite. Uh, there's nothing decided yet, but we have definitely just we've had meetings saying, you know, maybe we maybe we should have a policy saying you need to cite. Um, certainly at regional centers, there'll be there'll be pre-made tools. And if you use those tools, you should cite them so that kind of making it easy for people. Um, but yeah, the a publication policy that's more detailed like that is certainly on the cards. Yeah. Yeah. I think we've run out of time now. So yeah. Thank you very much, everyone.